and we have participants joining. So welcome everyone. Michael, can we make sure that my face is on the screen so people are oriented? It is high noon in Colorado, everyone. We're so happy to see you're yeah. joining us for our next lecture in our series hosted by the Coral Resiliency Arts Lab. Uh, that's the Colorado Resiliency Arts Lab here in Aurora, Colorado. Uh, my name is Katherine Reed. I am the art therapist and the manager of the Creative Arts Therapy Program here at Children's Hospital Colorado. I am so thrilled that you're with us. I'm still waiting for my face to get big on that screen because so far we just have a little one. We have a little picture. Um, so our technical folks are just going to get that going. Um, I want to welcome everyone to this lecture. We're really excited today uh, to have a very creative and uh, wise presenter. Until uh, she is ready, I'm going to just introduce you to what the series is about. Coral is a, uh, it's a team created with three different entities. One is my program, the Ponzio Creative Arts Therapy Program here at Children's Hospital Colorado. The second entity is the University of Colorado Research folks led by Dr. Mark Moss, who's our principal investigator of the study. And our third entity is uh, Lighthouse Writers Workshop, a, a nonprofit organization here in Denver that is really uh, branching out all over Denver and the state of Colorado to offer creative writing to all kinds of populations. So those are the three entities. We come together as researchers, as creative arts therapists, to study the uh, potential for creative arts therapy to reduce burnout in healthcare professionals and to increase resilience uh, through 12-week workshops that are in art, music, dance, movement, therapies, or writing as led by Light Lighthouse Writers Workshop. So those are our four clinical arms of our research. We are in our fourth year. We are funded by the National Endowment of the Arts and one of their flagship uh, research labs. We're about to hear from another today. And we are striving to create a vibrant, collaborative creative arts therapy community committed to enhancing healthcare professional well being and alleviating psychological stress in the workplace and beyond. Our vision is to encourage healthcare professionals to find their own creative outlet to build their identity and to establish a sense of community through these workshops and through the arts. By creating a more engaged workforce, we can support healthcare professionals in their efforts to improve patient outcomes, to enhance patient and family satisfaction, and to reduce healthcare costs. So this is our lecture series, and we are really lucky today to have Tamara Undereiner, PhD and Associate Dean for professional development and engagement in Arizona State University's Graduate College. She's also the associate professor in the School of Music, Dance, and Theater, where she serves as the founding director of the PhD program in Theater and Performance of the Americas. She also convenes Creative Health Collaborations, a university-wide effort to integrate the arts, humanities, and design approaches in health research, education, practice, and policy. Lots of words, very big title. With Dr. David W. Kuhn, she co-directs a new National Endowment of the Arts sponsored research lab, similar to CORAL, studying the health supporting role of the arts in different types of caregiving contexts via a range of participatory arts experiences involving both caregivers and their loved ones. So, Dr. Underreiner, Tamara, um, will be speaking to us today about mobilizing wonder as an art of care. And these will be reflections from the ASU Caregiving Lab's first two years. Whew, that was a big mouthful. I am so excited and honored to introduce Tamara, um, who is going to speak with us now. I, one last thing I have forgot to say, as a audience member, 
please know that your questions are important as you develop them through Tamara's uh, presentation. You can pop them into our question and answer section of the Zoom call, not the chat, but the question and answer section. And the last 10 or 15 minutes, I will be asking those questions to Tamara myself so you can hear the answers live. Um, so Tamara, thank you again for being with us and I will give you the mic. Thank you so much, Catherine. It is such a pleasure to be here today. I'm gonna try to get my screen share up so you can see some pictures because you're right, that is an awful lot of words in my uh, my description here. So I'm gonna uh, uh, share my words with a lot of pictures here. As Catherine mentioned, uh, the talk today is uh, mobilizing wonder as an art of care. And I'm gonna be talking about our research lab that's funded by the NEA. Uh, but I want to focus for a moment, just as we get started, on this notion of wonder, uh, because if the if the uh, ambition and mission of what Coral is about and the other projects that you're talking about is to uh, build resistance and uh, resistance re resilience and and reduce burnout, uh, wonder is such a, is a great way to think about doing that, if it, only for a moment, because when you're in an experience of wonder, uh, it's kind of hard to feel stressed out. Uh, Socrates tells us that the beginning of wisdom is wonder, and it's the beginning of so many other cool things in the world, scientific discoveries, medical breakthroughs, works of great art. And then the cool thing about art is that once it's there, it can also produce that experience of wonder too. So here we go. Let's get started. Uh, the art that I want to talk about is the wonder of theater. I am a theater historian. Folks of my generation uh, were trained to think about theater and healing, uh, theater and health from the get-go, because when we learned theater history, we learned about this particular uh, play, Oedipus Rex. Uh, that's what Aristotle theorized his great almost medical notion of catharsis through, uh, because this play is all about a pandemic. It's about a man's search for understanding how to get at the basis of it and, and cure it for his kingdom, only to learn that uh, its source was in his own family history, unfortunately. But of course, Oedipus Rex is a tragedy. We uh, know also from the historical record that theater has been deployed over time for its, its, its salutary effects through its lighter forms of art. Uh, we, the record tells us that many European medieval towns, Lord Mayors would uh, commission uh, entertainers like minstrels and jongleurs and, and clowns and acrobats literally to send in the clowns for the public health purposes to get them out, out of the weeds of a long winter when the, they were suffering in the grip of a grip, literally, uh, to, to feel better. So I'm talking to you today from Arizona State University. We're situated on uh, the ancestral and contemporary lands of the Akimel Odom people, who also go by the uh, designation Pima, the Pipash people, Maricopa peoples. Up to the north in Arizona, we are uh, home of the Navajo and the Hopi peoples. And if you know anything about the Hopi, you may be familiar that there's a great tradition there of the Katsina performers. The perform those are the, the amazingly rich symbolic dances that are highly uh, ritualized, but also improvised for a variety of social needs for their communities. And then those needs also include medicinal purposes. So some of the casinas are specifically designated for uh, to hold the wisdom, the, the health and healing wisdom of their communities. So my point is to say that the connection uh, between theater, uh, theatrical ritual and healing is both deep in the past and wide around the globe. And I could go on and on and on about that kind of relationship between theater and healing, uh, but I'm not, that's not the focus of my talk today. So uh, and to keep on that focus, we need to clarify some terminology. So let me get to that next. Uh, when I'm talking about you know, plays like Oedipus Wax, I'm talking about 
theater spectatorship. And that's really not the focus of today's comments. Nor am I, but there is a role, I should say, in the spectrum of arts and health for watching plays, especially for health promotion purposes. Uh, uh, and health education purposes, but we're not going to be talking about that today, nor am I going to be talking about drama therapy. Uh, there is also a, uh, an important place for that in uh, the theater and health spectrum. Drama therapy is conducted by trained professionals according to really specific protocols in service of a therapeutic goal for a client. Uh, but that's, again, not what I'm talking about today. And then thinking back to the Hopi Katsina performance, I'm not uh, either talking about theatrical ritual that is um, meant to uh, serve an individual or community for health purposes. So it's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is participatory theater. Participatory theater is in contrast to watching a play, it's making theater together, using the various arts of, that make a th the play a play. Uh, acting, uh, visual arts that make the scene happen, uh, costumes design, lighting design, sound design, music, dancing, movement, all of those. Uh, that's what goes into making a play together as opposed to simply passively watching it. So that's what we're going to be talking about. We talk about the participatory theater that's in some of the activities I'm going to share with you. Uh, the focus will be on the NEA lab uh, on caregiving research, but a lot went into making that lab come true. So I want to start by sharing, uh, as Catherine mentioned, the work with creative health collaborations that helped get us ready for that lab. Creative Health Collaborations, as she mentioned, is a, a loosely affiliated group of uh, researchers here at ASU, along with artists in the uh, area of design, humanities, uh, arts, and um, community partners. And we're interested in advancing education, research, and policy at the intersection of uh, health and those fields. Let me show you about a little bit about our collaborative framework here before we get going. I'm not going to go into this in great detail. The main point of this uh, particular slide is to show that uh, there's multiple ways into our collaboration. We don't focus on multiple exit points. We don't focus on an, any particular health condition or target population age range or demographic group or anything. We're really open and flexible uh, because really what we're focusing on is that intersectional approach uh, rather than a, a solving a particular condition because the, really what we're interested in is expanding and promoting the impact of arts and cultural approaches to uh, understanding uh, how to make uh, health and well-being advance in a community. Uh, and also building the evidence basis for that intersectional approach and strengthening the cross-sectional partnerships that will build the infrastructure for making that possible. So in order to read that slide, I had to move some pictures around here to see it. So now I've lost my cursor. So give me a second. Here we go. So let me share some projects that we've done over the years to give you a taste for what I mean by that. They've not all been participatory theater. Most of them have, but I want to start with this one. This is our the one that has to do with music, the B Sharp Wellness Music and Memory Project uh, in some long-term memory care facilities, which were our community partners, along with the Phoenix Symphony Orchestra. What we were trying to find out was um, whether the music had a positive effect on the stress levels of the residents, uh, especially around bath time, because that can be a stressful time for them. So that's when we took the measures of their uh, saliva uh, to see what it meant on their, what effect it had on the, their stress hormones as measured in their saliva. But I wanna share with you a particularly poignant an anecdote from our time there. Uh, the answer is, it, it did have a positive effect, not to leave you hanging, but I wanna share uh, this particular anecdote with you. Uh, this is a, a father who is a resident in the care facility with his daughter, who is his caregiver. And uh, when the music started, she invited him to dance, which they did. Uh, but after this 
um, this picture was taken. We don't have a photo record of this next scene I'm about to uh, share with you. Uh, the orchestra started to play a song and uh, also in the re residence facility was this man's wife. Now the, the man and the wife sadly no longer recognized each other as a uh, husband and wife, but they recognized this song because it had played during their wedding. So when they heard the first few strains of the music of this song, they got up and they found each other and they started to dance with each other. So this young woman, their daughter, who was their caregiver, had the chance to see her parents dancing together again after so many uh, months and, and possibly years of them not even recognizing each other. So that had an impact beyond measure on her. We couldn't design a protocol to make something like that happen, but it was there. So these are the kinds of moments of wonder that we get to have in the work that we get that we do. Uh, again, can't design necessarily for it, but we can create the conditions that allow for it to happen. So I'm going to move on to our next uh, set of projects that go under the banner of SENAS. Cultural Engagements in Nutrition, Arts, and Sciences. Senas, as if you speak Spanish, you might also know, is the word for dinner. And that uh, helped us reach some of the um, folks we were trying to reach with this particular intervention. Uh, this group of uh, researchers included a medical anthropologist on campus, some theater artists and scholars, an exercise specialist, and this uh, artist that we brought in from outside, who is now on the faculty here at ASU, uh, but started as a visiting artist with us. Uh, he's a performance artist who uh, specialized at the time in this cooking show, and the project was called The Diabetes of Democracy. And what we were trying to do with this particular study was uh, through the artist residency, uh, which was uh, supported by our Institute for Humanities Research, we were trying to uh, see if theater making workshops could help uh, in, in this nutrition awareness um, workshop focus on the validation of cuisines of origin and cultures of origin so that we could validate the idea that community health could, was based in culture and that you didn't have to adapt to a U.S. American diet to have a healthy, uh, healthy nutrition. The women in the top right corner are promotoras or community cultural health workers. And this was kind of a train the trainer using theater making techniques to elicit stories about what the food meant. And we took this to their communities, to local high schools and to the ASU community in general. From this, we developed another program called Arte Listo or Art Smart uh, that we took to two local elementary schools uh, doing again theater making workshops uh, supported by our artworks, such as another mechanism of the uh, uh, National Endowment for the Arts, uh, where this was basic nutrition education programs. And then we began to think could we scale this up? Would we bring this more to people who are uh, not necessarily in educational settings? Uh, children, but also to adults who are actually in clinical settings, such as those maybe who are on this call uh, and, and actually already in practice. So with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we went to Meharry Medical College, which is a historically black, black medical college, and uh, took it to their summer institute for health policy. And this was a two-week institute. We worked again with the same artist, Robert Carini, and uh, built the same kind of theater making workshops and a community kitchen for nutrition awareness to see what they might think of these, this approach in their practice. Some of these are were medical students um, medical students in training, but uh, other participants that already were in practice uh, working on continuing education. So now what I want to share with you are a couple of their three of their final projects to give you an idea of how creative they ended up getting. The first one was uh, the, the two people in the upper left corner were really interested in working with veterans. So the idea here is that veterans uh, 
for wh whether psychological or physical, have a lot of pain. And they wanted to do an approach that they call beyond the white coat to help them cope with their pain in ways that are different than just getting a pill for it. So they brought in nutrition, again, using the idea of culturally grounded nutritional awareness, meditation, and arts-based practices to, to build, a, to help the veterans, if, if you can see in the center panel here, help them restore balance and get back to the person they used to be. The second example is called the Style Doctors, and this, this approach uh, is based on the idea of kind of flipping the script of that's usual when you're trying to deal with, in this case, obesity-related diseases and helping people realize that they have to maybe lose a little weight or go to the gym. So instead of having a scolding conversation about uh, trimming up, this the first thing that the, these uh, doctors were recommending to their patients was that they go shopping. And so instead of a prescription, what they got was a voucher to an upscale clothing store in Nashville where they could try on a new set of clothes and, and try on with that a new healthy lifestyle. And then they would have the conversation about living up to this best self that they could be that might include going to the gym and having some healthier eating choices. So it was kind of flipping the script as the usual conversation goes. Speaking of conversations, this group was also becoming increasingly aware that some conversations are just difficult to have with among their constituents, maybe because they're embarrassed about things, maybe because there's some shame associated with it. So they thought that it might work to uh, change the context in which the conversation happens instead of doing it only in the doctor's office. So they came up with the idea of a community where they would, and they, they went full Southern fashion here with a very elegant tea, where they opened with a ritual of welcome and made, this one was kind of meta for our purposes because this conversation was about how to have the difficult conversations in their own respective practice areas. But the idea was to help them come up with ideas that they could take back to their own communities of practice and uh, open conversations and create conditions where they could have difficult conversations with their own patient constituents. So those are just three ideas that uh, we were kind of blown away by because the way they started, which I'm going to share with you in the next slide, was very, very narrow medical focus in their own work and their own practice. And where they ended up with is quite different. Uh, we asked them, will you, because this, you know, this was great for a two-week workshop, but are you going to do this when you get back to work? And this is what they told us. Before the seminar, Half of them never or rarely considered being creative like this at the, in their workplace. After the seminar, all of them said that they would at least sometimes try. And more than three quarters of them said that they often or regularly would. So we were very gratified by that. Uh, I want to share also with you that uh, as, uh, though we created this kind of quantity or collected this kind of quantitative data with our our participants, we were also very um, engaged qualitatively assessing the kinds of work we were doing with them, not only for program evaluation purposes, but for research purposes as well. And uh, there was a motif that kept coming up again and again and again in our work. And it boils down to one three-letter word uh, that just surfaced again and again and again in our, our review of the qualitative materials. And that word is joy. And, and that, like wonder, joy is a, is a stress buster. And so we are trying to figure out how can, for two reasons. How, first, how can we, you know, what you focus on expands and who doesn't want more joy in their life? So we would like to, we wanted to bring more about in the work that we were doing. But secondly, we felt like we had to kind of get serious about joy, if that makes sense, because we knew that, um, theater, let's face it, has a reputation, you know, for um, kind of being where the crazy people, the like crazy artists, you know, doing things that are undisciplined go. And we wanted to have, bring a discipline to it 
uh, in terms of collaborating with scientists. And we wanted to be able to explain what are the things that you do to create the conditions for the joy to happen, for the emotional arousals to happen, for the behavioral changes to happen. So with funding from the National Endowment for the Arts, we were able to work on developing a theoretical model that I'd like to share with you now. I understand that the inner ring of this model is difficult to read, so I'm going to call out those terms separately when we get to that point. But for now, I also want to mention that uh, the, the, there's a fully fleshed description of this in an article that we wrote that I cite at the bottom here. So if you're interested in hearing this, uh, reading about this at your leisure, take note of that citation because I'm going to go through this at a pretty fair clip. Okay, but this how theater making works is our attempt to uh, kind of dis discipline joy, if you will, so that we can do uh, explain how theater making works to our colleagues across the disciplines so that they can trust working with us, that we can say that, that we, uh, by creating this kind of a theater uh, experience, we can create the conditions for attitudinal and behavioral change to work. Also, this will help our theater colleagues uh, do the same thing when they are uh, working in health settings, such as the ones that we care about, bring these kinds of changes about. If we're talking about the attitudinal and behavioral change, we know we had to go to the pros. We worked with uh, <clears throat> our colleagues in social psychology to learn what they know about bringing such changes about in an individual, eventually in communities as well. But we're working at the individual now to get started. So the theoretical underpinnings of this model are from social cognitive theory as, uh, brought, as articulated by Albert Bandura, the theory of reasoned action, which uh, later uh, was re-articulated as the theory of planned behavior by Fishbein and Eisen, and culture-centric health promotion as articulated by Lorkey and Hecht. And that last one has to do with the importance of storytelling and narrative as in facilitating change, especially when it comes, as you, we talked about in that uh, diabetes of democracy example, when you're uh, talking about things that relate to your own cultural perspective. All right, so let's start, and this, I'm gonna start with what I think is really one of the most powerful uh, uh, concepts in our kit here, and that is the outer ring or bracketing. And that is, is both um, powerful, but something that you kind of immediately can understand. And that is the idea that theater is not real life. <laughs> theater is a space apart from real life, but it's also honestly the space where the magic happens. You've heard the expression that, you know, you need to suspend your disbelief here. Well, yeah, that's where all the good stuff can happen. That's where the rules of everyday life can be manipulated for new things to enter, new ideas to, to take shape, new behaviors to be tried on in that bracketed space, up, where it's, yes, real life, because it's still me, but it's also not real life, because it's, again, the uh, place apart from everyday life, and that's where the new ideas can emerge. So it's a really important concept that for your daily work can also happen imaginatively just for five minutes at a time. Let's pretend for a moment that this is not where we are and that mental break can make a huge difference in a person's well-being just for, for that mental space. The next ring inside are the components of theater. Uh, authorship has to do with you know, playwriting or collective devisement or storytelling. Uh, the things they work with are just to the right, multiple symbol systems, I touched on this before, words, actions, dance, music, song, lighting, sound, uh, movement, all the things that go into that are manipulated to bring the story to life. Uh, usually there's rehearsal, unless we're talking about straight up improv. Ensembles are created as people work together, even in solo performance, there's usually uh, other artists involved in bringing it to the stage. Uh, and then you're playing together, you're messing around until it gets, it gets finished. Uh, so those are the, the theater elements that uh, go into the theater making. Uh, 
That red ring next in line is uh, really important when you're talking about especially theater for uh, any kind of change. And that's, that's the idea of embodiment. When you're embodying a new idea, it literally gets in your bones in a different way. So that has uh, another powerful concept uh, toward individual or collective change. So now we're going to get into the inner ring here. So I'm going to call these words out. These words are all uh, borrowed and used in the theoretical uh, approaches that are on the left here. Uh, and they are also understood by us as mediators of change in the individual. So they're sort of like the the threshold zone between the theater and the person's psychology. So we, we understand that working on, with theater and making theater together has an effect through and on uh, these terms on the right and then, and then thereby on the individual's sense, for example, of agency. This is understood as the individual and sometimes collective ability to control, in this case, their health or to exert control over their situation, which I, again, I say is in this case, their health. Okay, so agency is, you know, you have agency over some kind of outcome. I'm going to put the next two together because they really go hand in hand. Identification with and resonance with something else. So it's something that you identify with and resonate with. This is, um, back to the culture-centric health promotion idea. If you're in a story you identify with, if you resonate with the characters, uh, that whether you're creating them or watching them, they're gonna, their story is gonna land in you in meaningful ways. If you're helping to create that story, all the more true. And if that story is part of your culture, uh, then it's even, even more so going to make sense to you. All of this then relates to the notion of self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is the idea that you believe, it's, it's the, not just the idea, but the conviction that you believe you can do something. If you don't have that conviction, it's not likely that you will. So it's that you have the, the sense that you have the person, personal ability to carry something out is kind of a precondition for you to carry it out. So if we're talking about a healthy, new healthy behavior or attitude about something, it's kind of a precursor to that thing coming out. Not just a precursor, but a prerequisite. And then uh, in, in social psychology or in life and education, reinforcement is a powerful um, force for behavior change. Theater seems kind of built for that because of the rehearsal process. The more you do something, the more it gets you know, baked into you. So we see that as a kind of part and parcel of the process of uh, assisting in behavior change. Modeling too goes hand in hand with that. Uh, in social cognitive theory, modeling is part of the observational learning that uh, helps people grow into a new way of thinking about something. So when you're in a theater situation, uh, other people are modeling new things, and if they are your peers and you respect them, you're going to do it too. You're more likely to do it too. And over the course of many theater experiences, soon you become the model too, which is even more powerful. And those of us who are teachers in the room know that uh, you teach what you most need to learn, and, and as you change roles in the course of the theater experimentation, or you would go through different theater experiences and you go from looking at a model to becoming one, uh, all of these new uh, ideas become even further and baked into your own expanding repertoire of new selves. And then all of this finally leads to different kinds of emotional arousal. We've been talking about wonder and joy, uh, and those are the kinds of things you want to kind of create the conditions are for positive changes. Uh, but we know too that the um, negative ones can also exert uh, effects too for uh, 
behaviors you want to have people kind of avoid. Uh, remember that CDC campaign in the 90s, so those of you who are older might remember when they were trying to get people to stop smoking and they pre presented these ads that portrayed it as a tumor causing, teeth staining, nasty, pukey, smelly habit. And it actually had a kind of an effect. So uh, the, the emotions can go both ways. We just have to be, these are things that help you become intentional in your design of interventions that have theater components to them. So this is normally the point where I would stop and say, are there any questions class? Uh, but we are, uh, as Catherine mentioned, going to be saving them for the end. I know it's a lot. So I take a deep breath and now I'm going to just, uh, move to talking. This is all that came before our move to establishing the NEA Caregiving Research Lab at ASU. So I'm going to move to talking about our most recent study, which just wrapped. And that is um, part of a three-part project that we hope you know, will continue forward. Uh, so let me just introduce you to the lab and its vision. Mm. And then we'll get started on <clears throat> our findings there. So our caregiving research lab is um, meant to uh, look at uh, families who, <laughs> if anyone needs it, uh, uh, need, need a little more joy in their lives. Uh, the Creative Health collaborators that uh, we've been working with over the past eight years or so all share a concern for one reason or another with uh, providing care, uh, but more at the informal level, uh, not at the formal level of, level of professional uh, settings. So the projects that we were looking at, given our own research interests, have to do with families of children with special needs, uh, particularly those who have medically complex conditions, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, that one just wrapped, and that's what I'll be uh, sharing with you. Uh, we just started the one that's on the right, uh, which is uh, creative expression through writing, which I know you guys are talking about doing as part of the, your project scope as well, uh, for people who have a cancer diagnosis in their family. So uh, that's just now getting underway. And then our next project will have to do with veterans and PTSD using the music intervention. So that's on the horizon. But right now, we just finished up uh, doing our data analysis on our first project. So let me turn to that one. Uh, this was with our community partners, uh, Raising Special Kids Arizona and Child's Play Theater Company, which is based in Tempe. Uh, and they, as I mentioned, it was uh, working with children who have medical complexity. So in case you don't know what that term means, let me explain it very briefly. These are uh, children who have congenital or acquired multi-system disease or a severe neurologic condition. Uh, who have some kind of impairment, or they require some kind of technological uh, assistance for daily living. They're medically fragile and their needs often exceed existing healthcare models. Let me share with you uh, something one of our parents drew for us to help us understand what her daily life is like. She's down there in the lower right-hand corner uh, her, as the parent or the designated caregiver of the of the day or moment. And she's got to coordinate her family, her home life, her work life, her school life, her social life, paying the bills, and then the health of everybody in her family, including herself. And then she's got to coordinate all of for her child with medically complex needs. There's all the people in the medical side, all of those different specialists who are in the green, in the green on the right, left there. Uh, ranging from the pediatrician, immunologist, gastroenterologist, all the way down. And there's an emergency need, the emergency department right down at the bottom there. There's the Division of Developmental Disabilities and all of the support care that provides uh, her child's needs there. Insurance forms, uh, durable medical equipment, and then everybody in the school and all of the support staff there that kind of needs to be co coordinated with all of the people to the left there on a daily basis. It's mind boggling. I think I have a complicated life. So 
And this, and this is what she asked us to keep in mind as we developed our convention. Uh, on the front, such a mom made, this is not her, but another one made a front page uh, news in the Arizona Republic in October. So I had to cut the picture out because it's so relevant for the purposes here. Uh, she became a licensed health aide just so that her school would have better coordination with the medical side of that uh, map. Um, and that was uh, considered newsworthy, just trying to illustrate the problems or the challenges, I should say, that such families face. We were interested in supporting them because the impact on the family caregivers is so enormous that their own health can be impacted. Uh, as I mentioned, that's an overwhelming amount of care coordination that's required usually of the parents. So without coping mechanisms, their own mental health can decline, leading to feelings of depression and anxiety. So if we want to, if anybody needs more joy in their life, as I mentioned, it's them. And we wanted to figure out how can we capture that and mobilize it as my talk uh, describes. Um, and we turned for assistance in this regard to uh, some new, rather new work that's being done by psychologist Mark Runko and the notion of creative openness, which is the idea that um, oh, auto uh, autonomy, flexibility, the, the definition of it is autonomy, flexibility, preference for complexity, self-confidence, and ego strength are all components of coping mechanisms that can kind of build resilience uh, in folks, especially like in a caregiving context. So our research questions were, can participatory theater, I keep losing my cursor here, uh, contribute to creative openness between caregivers and children with medical complexity? And does participatory theater change the caregivers' perceptions of their relationships with their children with special needs? Our hypothesis was that the, the parents, without changing any of their current focus on taking care of their children, would, would they enjoy playing together such that, in a participatory theater context, such that these effects would follow? Their perceived stress would be reduced their general level of well-being would increase, their perceptions of their relationships would change in a positive way, and their perceptions of quality of life would improve. The ways we would measure this would be through the World Health Organization questionnaire that has five questions assessing well-being, the perceived stress scale, which has 28 items assessing stress over the past month, the quality of life scale, 16 items, uh, assessing six domains of life quality. And the family APGAR, which is, uh, you know, the APGAR that they give to newborns measuring how, how strong they are on six different measures. The family APGAR is, uh, measures adaptation, partnership, growth, affection, and resolve. Our intervention was going to be uh, depending on whether we were in the first semester or second, eight to 10 weekly workshops at Child's Place Theater Facility, 90 minutes each session. The theater artists would, uh, a different theater artist would be assigned to each caregiver child team and then take them through different creative processes, depending on the theater artist specialization and the child's um, skills and ca capacities. Uh, and then the fo focus would be mostly on the theater making in an improvisational and devising way. In other words, we weren't necessarily going to ask them to put on a show, but if they wanted to and they were up to it, that would be open. We would be open to that too. But mainly we were um, going to aim for informal sharings in the teams and uh, send them home in between weeks with optional in-home activities. And we were all set to go in March of 2020. So you can imagine that didn't happen. Instead, we had to go back and rethink everything. So uh, here's, let me explain then what we ended up doing instead. We kept our 
research questions, we kept our hypothesis, but we totally redesigned our intervention. Uh, Child's Play is amazing. I just have to send a shout out to them. Their theater artists are the most creative people I have uh, encountered in a long time. They, they took hardly any time to reconfigure uh, the, their uh, thoughts about it. And they basically created theater in a box. And this is uh, what our new intervention looked like on the outside. Uh, now, I have an example with me today that I'd like to share with you if there's time in the Q&A. It's because it's a little hard to show in this small box of the Zoom screen. Um, and uh, we sent it home and had the parents basically, with the help of a teaching artist who met with them over the Zoom like this once a week, uh, we changed our intervention up, but we kept our research questions and here's what it all looked like. The family received a new wonder box every six weeks. The heart of the wonder box was a, a children's storybook. Uh, there were three different ones, once every six weeks. So one was called Windows, one was called Dress Up and Let's Have a Party, which I have here today. And one was called The Imaginaries. Each one had 10 activities that had that the, the five teaching artists designed that were based on theater, uh, the world of theater. So the activities were focused on sound-based activities or storytelling activities or costuming activities, things that were inspired by making theater. They weren't designed to make theater though, they're just inspired by it. And then this dedicated lead teaching artists would check in weekly via Zoom. Then families shared feedback with us via reaction cards and then a handheld app on their telephone that was like a classroom learning system, like but it's called Class Dojo, but it was if you know Blackboard or Canvas, it was that kind of a thing. So let me share some pictures of what they, uh, the components looked like. This map uh, kind of oriented the parents to what the content of the box was like. Uh, so this, this is from box number two, dress up and let's have a party. Uh, so you see that the activities were oriented around sound, the environment, acting, storytelling, and creating different kinds of things that were two activities per topic there. Uh, and then the parents would pursue the activities with their kids and then keep track of how much they liked them, which we used for uh, data as well as for, show in a second. So here's a child interacting with some of the materials there. That's one of the activities card. That QR card code helped uh, get more um, instructions about how to use it. And so feedback uh, gave the opportunity for them to provide more feedback. There's the class dojo on the telephone and then the scorecard, which we used both for data and for formative assessment. Is, uh, we did a pilot with one box in July uh, just to make sure that the boxes would work at all, which they did. So um, let me show, we have some pictures here of the children interacting. This is Theo. He uh, loved to dress up and make up. Uh, dress up and let's have a party. I have to share with you, this is one of my favorite opening lines of all literature. Uh, I think it's very invitational and uh, maybe give you a little moment of stress release today. Once while his mother was baking a cake, John tried on the pots and pans. It's a picture of John trying on the pots and pans. I think treating kitchen utensils as costume is a very wildly, wonder wildly wonderful idea. And um, in this case, none of the parents complained about it. So uh, this is Theo uh, interacting with some of the materials provided in the Wonder Box. Uh, it wasn't only just costumes and dress up. He had to call his friends to have a party at his house. So there's the old fashioned um, telephone game with uh, two cans and a rope. And then there were all sorts of party supplies in there so that they could stage a party in their house as well. So this one got high marks, uh, at least in this particular family. Uh, this is from another story called Windows. Uh, and so 
you could create another story about what might happen walking down the street, looking at all the windows in the neighborhood. And so this is from another child uh, thinking about something else that might happen when you're encountering uh, uh, scenes in the street. This child was not crazy about dressing up. He thought he was too old for such games, but he did repurpose some of the materials to make a picture of himself for his mom, which she uh, loved and was very happy about. She gave us that uh, emoticon uh, to make sure we understood that she was thrilled with that uh, creative improvisation on the materials themselves. So, um, it all, uh, the intervention was uh, in some ways not exactly what we had wanted to do, but the findings uh, surprising in, in other ways. So let me share them with you now. I'm going to keep moving my picture around so I can move it. First, uh, the quality of life score significantly improved uh, from those who completed their responses. Second, well-being improved, but uh, not as significantly. Third, there was no change in their perceived, perceived stress scale and no change in the family apple. These last two results are um, more significant to us than, than may seem. While we hoped they would improve, <laughs> we were gratified that they didn't uh, become worse because here we are relying on the families basically to deliver the intervention because it was COVID and we could not, and this is much more lockdown conditions when we did this work. We were really concerned that this would actually put a burden on the families. And in fact, it's uh, the fact that it was unchanged means at least that it didn't increase their burden. So that was um, not insignificant to us. Thinking about lessons learned, oh, I'm sorry, 30 families participated. In fact, we had a waiting list to get into the study, uh, but strangely, only 14 went all the way to completing the post-assessment, uh, though they were interacting with the materials up to the end and positively. So not exactly sure what happened with that last survey response. We wish we could have gotten more, and we don't know what that would have meant to these results. So from some lessons learned, uh, as I think has become clear, uh, the caregiving context for families of children with medical complexities is itself complex. So being flexible and offering a variety of opportunities to interact like this is key, I think, to uh, designing such interventions. Also, I think a little uh, grace in the pivot was evident in that the redesign allowed us to prioritize participant control over what was happening. Had the parents been um, kind of compelled to come to a child's play over the weekend, we might have had a lot more attrition and uh, less. they might have experienced less control over the circumstances. Therefore, some of those intermediary um, things like self-efficacy and agency might have dropped out of the equation. Uh, creative openness does indeed seem to be playing a role here for both participants and researchers. We had to remain creatively open ourselves to, to new ideas and not to become too stressed out about the plan not proceeding apace. Uh, it can lessen the burden of care. Uh, at, least it, at least it did not increase it. And uh, this was sparked out only by the creative activities. But interestingly enough, the artists shared with us that had the intervention occurred on site, they would have been focusing more on teaching the skills of theater, uh, uh, teaching theater techniques. And as it was in the redesign, <clears throat> they focused more on the embodied senses of the children, like the creating tactile experiences and creating uh, wonder in each of the uh, 10 activities, and that that might have been what uh, compelled further engagement. And again, I'm going to put a pitch in here for the bracketing. Uh, sending these wonder boxes home created a 
new chance for parents to create a special place with their kids. This wasn't just a game. This was a space of imagination uh, and that I think you cannot gainsay uh, in these kinds of circumstances. Uh, from our ongoing collaborations across the years of working together, you may have heard this from other speakers, uh, the cross learnings about our different approaches to working in this kind of domain is just so rich. We all come at this in different ways and we learn from each other. And I have been um, kind of humbled by how creative my scientific colleagues are in, in doing this kind of work together. So I, I really feel my life has been enriched by beginning to work uh, outside of theater with my uh, anthropologist colleagues, my exercise colleagues, my, artist, my uh, straight up artist colleagues and my health scientist colleagues. Uh, and the chance, oh, in, in, Richard, in kind of reverse, the chance that I have heard from practitioners that we collaborate, like parents, to focus on wellness and uh, asset-based approaches rather than deficit approaches has been uh, kind of healthy for them. This was not advancing. And they, they tell us that they enjoy being able to scratch uh, new, their, the itches that they have that their training doesn't always let them scratch and they have an opportunity to honor their whole selves in this kind of work in ways that they don't always feel that they get to. So moving forward, <clears throat> excuse me, let's, I would like to make a plea for more such collaboration between researchers, artists, and health professionals, which means more funding, please. What strategies can we develop to help break down uh, funding silos among the sponsoring agencies? Uh, I'm talking about at the federal level, but also regionally, locally, and even in our own institutions uh, so that we can do more of this kind of work. And then finally, more wonder, more openness to wonder as a legitimate methodology. I think back to that uh, scene in the, in the memory care facility of the couple dancing because the conditions were there. How can we create those conditions and, and validate that uh, not all measures are going to get us there? So maybe we need some new ways of, of measuring itself. That's all I have today. I thank you for the time to share these, these memories of my own and these collaborations over the years. I look forward to your questions and I wanna thank uh, Catherine and Mark, David, Mike, Noah, all the people behind the scenes who made this possible. And I uh, look forward to hearing what your thoughts are. Thank you. All right, Tamara, thank you so much. That was really fascinating and so intriguing, the uh, details of the research itself. I am afraid we only have a couple minutes, so I am not going to have time to ask uh, both of our questions. We have two questions. Um, blah, 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 blah. I'm trying to decide if I should just ask one of them. Uh, how would a model of wonder box with expressive writing and art for healthcare workers be fundable? So we have about one minute for you to answer that question. She talks, there's a, it's a further question about being in healthcare and just the healthcare system with minimal arts investment. Um, so any words you have, Tamara, about funding and research? What a great question. <laughs> uh, I think in terms of funding, the, um, the, the best prospects, I think, at the moment that we're looking at are um, charitable foundations that uh, are moving in the direction of charitable grants. So they give a little bit more flexibility for these kinds of innovative approaches. Um, okay, thanks, Tamara. So I wanna take this time to thank you, Tamara. This was really an incredible hour to learn more about your research at uh, Arizona State University. Um, and I want to invite everyone to our next speaker next month. Her name is Jennifer Novak, and she'll be talking about the impacts of engaging with art and artists on individuals and their communities. 
insights from survey research on well-being and healing. I want to thank uh, Tamara Underwriter for her time and her wisdom today. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but I encourage everyone to reach out to Tamara if you would like to know further details about the research. There were two questions about control group and um, the methodology itself. So I encourage you to reach out to Tamara. She's wonderful to speak with. And thank you so much for being with us today, Tamara. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great month.